They've done their duty, and they ask nothing more than that this country does ours. The president takes on the VA hospital scandal, what he says will happen moving forward. The results are in. Who's advancing to the general election after Tuesday's primaries, and who still has a runoff ahead? Arrested in Iran, how a music video led to jail time. Plus, the latest on the debate over Common Core standards. Those stories and more just ahead on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, May 21st, 2014. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Patrick. Looking at news now, there's a brand new information out there tonight about concerns for the Pope's safety during his trip to the Holy Land. Federal agents in Israel have told several Jewish extremists that they have to stay away from the Holy Father. A police spokesman said what he called right-wing activists wanted to carry out, quote, provocative and illegal acts, though they didn't say what exactly those acts were. Meanwhile, here in Washington, President Obama met this morning with VA Secretary Eric Shinseki. They talked about the growing concern about poor service and care at VA hospitals, which some say are linked to major medical problems, even death. After the meeting with Secretary Shinseki, the president said people have to be held accountable, but he wants to wait for the results of an inspector general's investigation before taking major action. The president also talked about calls for Shinseki to resign. I know he cares about it deeply, uh, and you know he has been a great public servant uh, and a great warrior on behalf of the United States of America. Uh, we're going to work with him to solve the problem. The president emphasized the need to work with Congress as well to fix problems that are plaguing the VA hospital system. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. We now have a better picture of how this year's midterm general elections will look. There were some big primaries yesterday, and the results came in last night. In Kentucky, Republican Senator Mitch McConnell beat his Tea Party opponent. The Senate Minority Leader will face Democrat Allison Grimes in November. Less than 24 hours after the primary, the two are already taking shots at each other. My opponent is in this race because Barack Obama and Harry Reid want her to be in this race. This election will be about holding you, Senator McConnell, accountable for all that has happened on your watch. And in Georgia, the Republican race still isn't over. Businessman David Perdue and Congressman Jack Kingston will meet in a July 22nd runoff after neither won a clear victory last night. Well, whoever wins that race will face off against Michelle Nunn, who won last night's Democratic primary in Georgia. That name sounds familiar. She is the daughter of former Senator Sam Nunn. An update, update now to a story that we brought you yesterday. Pennsylvania Governor Tom Corbett says tonight he won't appeal this week's decision by a federal court judge. That judge overturned Pennsylvania's definition of marriage as a union between a man and a woman. The governor says he's opposed to gay marriage but doesn't think an appeal would be successful. Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion of the Bishop's Conference Subcommittee on the Promotion and Defense of Marriage says the Pennsylvania Attorney General is derelict in her duties by not defending the state marriage law. Well, there's another suit from gay couples over the right to legally marry, this one in Montana. That state's constitution doesn't allow same-sex marriages. The suit claims the law denies gay couples freedoms enjoyed by others. Turning now to news from overseas, there have been three more deadly attacks in Nigeria. At least 48 people have died, according to a security officer there. Boko Haram is again behind these attacks. Meanwhile, lawmakers on Capitol Hill held a hearing today on that terrorist group. Just watch what they say. It is about radical Islamic belief. And I wish you, you know, you, you said you wish they would, they would uh, differentiate or discriminate. They were so discriminating. Yes, they'll hit other Nigerians. They'll hit other Westerners. But Christians are their main target. Say a survivor of a Boko Haram attack was also at today's hearing. And we have just learned that the U.S. has deployed 80 military personnel to Chad. They will work to help find the nearly 300 missing girls kidnapped by Boko Haram. President Obama notified Congress about that move in a letter today. And we have a story about the toll that mass kidnapping is taking. EWTN's Jason Calvi reports on a family affected by Boko Haram's reign of terror. Boko Haram kidnapped Martha and Reverend Enoch Mark's daughter, Monica. 
I'm thinking about my daughter because I've been separated from my beloved daughter and it's a problem. My thought of her is my greatest worry. The Islamic terrorist group snatched Monica and 275 other girls from this school in northern Nigeria. This is the rubble left in Boko Haram's wake. Community leader Malam Dunama says they couldn't fight the terrorists. It is possible they can come and kidnap the whole village and go away with it. What can we do? We don't have ammunition, only we have sticks, bow and arrow. We cannot stand these people. But this student, Joy Bashara, escaped by jumping off a truck. Many of them, I recognize them. They are, some of them, all of them, we are in the same class. Some of them are my friends. I recognize many among them. It's only in photos that missing Monica's family can see her now. It's likely her outfits have changed. In this Boko Haram video, it shows the girls wearing Muslim clothes. I hope that the government will help tomorrow or the next day and brings back our daughters. But as the days go by and life here in Shabak continues with 276 missing, the pain remains. We cannot eat. Now God can comfort us a bit so that we can drink water. I hope that God will make the kidnappers bring back our daughters. Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. What a horrible situation for those families. Let us keep them in our prayers. Well, some 200 firefighters are working to put out a blaze in Arizona. That number includes five of the elite hotshot fire crews. 100 businesses and homes had to be evacuated near Slide Rock State Park. So far, there are no reports of injuries, and more firefighters are on the way to help fight that blaze. In New York City, visitors are lining up to see the National 9-11 Memorial Museum on the first day it's open to the public. The opening ceremony for the museum included the unrolling of an American flag that was discovered nearby after the Twin Towers collapsed. The underground museum features some very heavy material, portraits of nearly 3,000 victims and voicemail messages from people in hijacked planes. Because of the potential traumatic impact on visitors, designers included built-in tissue boxes and easy exits from the most intense exhibits. It's beautiful, the inside. It's very somber because there was firemen in there looking at pictures of uh, some of their friends that died. And just quiet, very quiet inside. More than 42,000 9-11 victims, relatives, survivors, and recovery workers have already visited the museum, which opened to them last Thursday. It's a song that makes you want to clap your hands and maybe sing along. Pharrell Williams' Happy peaked at number one. It's still in the top ten. A lot of people have even made parodies of the original music video. Here come bad news, talking this, and that. this video right here has landed a group of six young people in Iran in jail. That country has laws against women dancing in public. A police spokesman even said the video hurt public chastity. There are unconfirmed reports that the people in the video have been released now, and we're actually confirming some of the, those reports. The incident, though, is drawing attention to strict laws in Iran based on Islamic tradition. We're joined by Nagar Mortazavi, a journalist from Iran, now based here in Washington. It's great to have you with us. We're really interested in your take on this. So what do you think it was that they did illegally that got them arrested? It hasn't been specifically said what the, what the charges are. It definitely has to do with the video, but as you can see, they're girls and boys dancing. The girls are not covered up. They don't wear hijab, and it's even though they filmed this at the private of their home, it was published to the world and it was made public. So I think what the whole that's what the whole fuss was about. As someone who is very familiar with Iran's culture, are you surprised by this? By the arrest, actually, no. We were discussing this with a friend after the video was published. There was, in fact, three versions from Iran. And the two other versions, the girl were mostly covered up. And this was the only version that was made at a house, and the girls were not wearing hijab. And we were saying that we were worried about them getting arrested. And uh, we weren't 100 percent sure, looking from the outside, if this is something that is still causing uh, controversy. And the arrest showed that it is. So. Does this music video really reflect what's going on in Iran? 
I think it does for a good portion of the youth. I mean, Iranian youth, a lot of them, I don't want to speak for the, for the whole country, but a lot of the Iranian urban youth are modern youth, just like everybody else. They listen to Pharrell Williams. They respond to his call for making fan videos of his, of his song. And they, they wear similar clothes to everybody else. They like to sing and dance and be together and be happy. And um, these kids, I think, pushed the boundaries a little bit more than um, than what the other two videos did and and the courage sometimes you know get, gets you in a little bit of trouble but it's good that they were released today well because of the controversy and you've confirmed that they have been released yes. right because of the controversy though I think it's easy for Americans or really anybody in the Western world to get this really weird and probably off base concept of what life is really like in Iran there are really two sides to this aren't there Exactly. And sometimes the two sides can be very, very exaggerated and you really have to put the two together. You might look at this video and think that's what life is in the entire Iran and that is not very accurate. But you might also see a, their video of being arrested and think that's how Iran is being and that's not 100 percent true. So it's I would say a very um, long term struggle between the two sides. The the ones who want to keep the traditions as they were and then the modern progressive who want more liberties, who want to live a different life and they're constantly pushing the boundaries and the other side off obviously is backfiring and it's just this constant struggle that keeps going on. So the president of Iran actually responded to this on Twitter. What did he say? He said it was actually part of his speech that was made last year. So his Twitter team pulled that up and oh. just republished it saying happiness is okay for our people and uh, we shouldn't be too hard on behaviors that are caused by joy. That was part of his speech. That was a very important reaction. So I think what the president has done, he's made some achievements in the foreign policy sphere and he's getting more into the domestic liberties that he had been uh, promising during the election. And it looks like he is trying to bring that debate more into the public sphere. So he was known as somehow negotiating behind the scenes with the hardliners, but I feel like these are moves that are showing that he's bringing this, this uh, debate to the public. He has talked about more freedom as far as internet and social media recently. He made a speech. He asked the youth to join social networks and be more active and even mentioned that that was one of the reasons he got elected last year. So. I think he right now seems to be teaming up with the progressives. Yeah, he sounds very moderate. Yeah. Nagar, thank you so much for adding thank the insight you. to this story, and we hope you'll come back and visit us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, this evening, we're learning more about a close call in the sky. Two planes flying just yards away from one another, and now the government is getting involved. The National Transportation Safety Board has released new information on a near miss at Newark's Liberty International Airport. Okay, yeah, we're putting the nose down and uh, yeah, he's real close. The NTSB says two planes nearly collided last month at the New Jersey airport, coming within just yards of each other. This is a very well choreographed dance in the sky. Lots of planes coming in and out very quickly out of airports. However, one little thing goes wrong, it throws the entire line of flights off. United Express Flight 4100 was cleared for takeoff. At the same time, United Airlines Flight 1243 was landing on April 24th. Audio from the air traffic control tower show controllers telling the pilot to circle the airport. Yeah, 1243 go around, both low through the intersection, traffic off your left departing. Experts say recent runway construction at Newark could have contributed to close calls. In Newark right now, because of the runway construction, it makes it much, much more difficult to do this delicate balancing act of making sure that planes arrive and depart quickly, but also keep the safe distance from each other. But Newark's near miss is not the first of its kind showing further government regulations may be necessary. This case, the planes actually did seem a lot closer together than they should have been. It's just a little too close for comfort, and regulators will be looking at this issue carefully and hopefully in, um, making sure it doesn't happen again. A spokesman for United Airlines told the AP, quote, we are working with the NTSB in its review of the incident. The NTSB has not said what initially caused the accident, and their final report is expected to take months. No damage to either plane or injuries to passengers was reported.
Coming up, the Pope is going to the Holy Land and he's not the only one. The tourism impact of the Pope's trip. And a new report on the crisis in Syria. We'll break it down for you. This is EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, May 21st. Thanks for joining us today. In his Wednesday general audience, Pope Francis preached on Christians as custodians of creation. The Holy Father is still in Rome, but he will not be there for long. Pilgrims from many countries joined Pope Francis in St. Peter's Square today ahead of his trip to the Holy Land. The Pope joyfully received a gift from one young boy and got a special welcome from another young man with Down syndrome. He also spoke about his upcoming travels and a history-making meeting of Eastern and Western Christianity that will take place. This Saturday, I will travel to the Holy Land, the land of Jesus. It will be a strictly religious trip. In the first place, I will meet my brother Bartholomew I as an homage for the 50th anniversary of the encounter between Pope Paul VI and Athenagoras I. Peter and Andrew will meet again, and this is beautiful. This meeting symbolizes the work of Catholic and Orthodox sister churches throughout the world to regain the full unity they had the first thousand years of their existence. It's kind of a country swap, if you will. This rabbi from Jerusalem just paid a visit to Holy Face Shrine in Italy. The church houses a cloth imprinted with the face of Jesus that's reported to match the veil of Veronica. He told us what Jews think about the Pope's visit. It's a very welcoming move from him, from him to, to come visit uh, Jerusalem is, I mean, the spirituality is so heavy, you can al almost feel it, yeah. you know, yes. like, like um, on a material level, physically you can feel it. The Pope arrives in Jerusalem on Sunday. Well, where the Pope goes, his flock is sure to follow. Tourism ministries in Israel and Palestine are also getting ready for Pope Francis's visit. They expect an increase of tens of thousands of Christians visiting Israel ahead of and following the Pope's pilgrimage. The Pope's schedule includes a stop in Jordan and the river where Jesus is said to have been baptized. Then it's on to Bethlehem and Jerusalem. He'll celebrate Mass at the Church of the Nativity, which marks the site where Jesus was born. In the market streets of Jerusalem's old city, shop owners welcome the influx of tourists and voice hope for the Pope's visit. What we need in Jerusalem is real peace, justice, reconciliation. This is the purpose of the visit. Christian visitors account for about 60% of Israel's tourism industry. Amnesty International reports today thousands of Syrian refugees can't get medical treatment in the countries where they fled. The report says some refugees in Lebanon are being forced to return to the danger zone in their home country to try to get hospital care. This comes on the heels of a UN report stating that half of Syria's health centers have been destroyed and the country is facing dramatic food shortages. 2.7 million Syrians have fled the conflict in the past three years. Dale Hansen Burke has served on the boards of World Vision and International Justice Mission. She is with us after just returning from a trip to Jordan. You got to speak to the refugees there. I did. What was it that really jumped out at you from those interactions that you had? You know, it's heartbreaking to see these people who had had normal lives and had been so displaced by this, this tragedy. Um, but I was also impressed by the Jordanians and how they had taken them in. So many of these Syrian refugees are just living with Jordanians and just finding places to, to stay. Uh, only about 20 percent are in the refugee camps. The rest are actually staying with people or camping in, in tents or just finding a place where they can, they can really let rest their head and, and find shelter. Did you see any evidence that they weren't getting proper health care, as this report just stated? Yeah, I didn't see that. Um, my, what I saw was people who were really trying to uh, be helped through the Jordanian system, but were being, you know, they're overwhelming the system. I mean, they're coming thousands a, a day into this uh, country that's not that large and not that, uh, has, it doesn't have that many resources to deal with them. Refugee is kind of an overused term, and I don't think we really connect with it. If you think about uprooting your children and getting them out of bed and saying, we got to run and go somewhere and we don't know where we're going, 
Talk about the children a little yeah, bit. Yeah, absolutely. These are middle class people. These were kids who were in school. These were families. I met doctors and engineers and architects who'd been living a normal life and then suddenly had to leave. And they had to leave with just what they had on their backs. So these children have been displaced. Um, some of them traumatized. Some of them have seen their neighborhoods blown up. Some of them have seen people killed in front of them. So it's a it's really a, a very sad thing to see these children and to see them trying to you know to find a normal life. Do they have any hope for a better future? Yeah, I mean, I think I asked a lot of them about going back to Syria, and most of them felt that it was going to be a very long time before they could go back. So I think a lot of their hope uh, resides in what the people in Jordan and other countries are doing for them, which is really remarkable. I mean, we saw churches um, that were really opening their doors and doing everything they could to help these refugees. It was really heartening to me uh, to see, you know, less than 3% of the population in Jordan is Christian, and yet these Christians had gone really out of their way to help uh, these refugees. It was really remarkable. Pope Francis will be stopping there in Syria. Uh, what do you think his visit will mean to these people? Yeah, it means a lot. Uh, you know, it means a lot to both the Muslim population, which is 97% of the population, as well as the Christians. And it's going to bring a lot of attention, I think, to the refugee situation, to show just how difficult it is. He's insisted on having some of the refugees come to the Jordan River with him, which I think is a really remarkable thing to do. Um, and he's, you know, I think he's going to also be able to shine light on this Christian community in a, in a very, you know, small minority that is doing so much in the Middle East. Uh, I think to me that's the most important thing you can do is to is to really kind of give respect and um, and credence to this this group of people. Is there anything we can do? Absolutely. I that's really why I went was to see what could be done. And you know there are so many churches and organizations there that are working really selflessly, not getting a lot of support. So um, I would say you know support the parishes and the churches that are working in the in, in Jordan uh, with refugees, as well as organizations like World Vision and others that are doing so much to help them. Great, we appreciate that. Dale Hansen Burke, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Up next, a cyber attack could put you at risk. The alert from a popular internet site that you need to hear. Plus, there's new talk about what your children learn in the classroom. Who's now weighing in to the discussion about Common Core? On EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick, and there's breaking news. Police in California have just found a kidnapping and sexual assault victim missing for 10 years. They have also found the suspected captor. We'll have more on this story tomorrow on EWTN News Nightly. Meanwhile, the debate over the Common Core curriculum standards isn't likely to end anytime soon. Just this month, lawmakers in two states took two very different positions involving those math and English standards. Right now, 44 states and D.C. have adopted Common Core, which sets bench benchmarks for students in kindergarten through 12th grade. Six states have either rejected the standards or only partially implemented them. But the standards have come under fire from conservative groups, and some question whether that map will change. Our Wyatt Goolsby is here with those details. Wyatt? Brian, some lawmakers in North Carolina are doing a double take when it comes to the Common Core standards. A bill introduced in that state would create a new commission to take a closer look at whether they still want Common Core or whether they need to make changes. On the other hand, in Mississippi, their state's Board of Education voted to spend more than $8 million on Common Core testing material. Across the country, the standards are gaining some scrutiny. It's so critically important that we not uh, jettison this idea and get on to something new because we will fall farther and farther behind. A warning today from a group of former Republican governors speaking at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. American students are falling behind other countries in terms of math and English, which is why they say critics of Common Core should take another look. You know, I think there's so much misinformation over the Internet, and uh, Common Core has kind of come a whipping boy in the primary season. But I think most reasonable people, parents who want their children to aspire to be all they can be, if they understood the Common Core was really about higher standards, I think they would be desirous of that. Former Georgia Governor Sonny Perdue tells us because of those reasons, it's hard to sort through the truth from myths. Critics have cried federal overreach, pointing to funding for supporting states from the Obama administration. In addition, some parents have voiced concern with specific material they say is too graphic for students' age range. Defenders of Common Core say teachers still have control over the material used in the classroom, and states can make the final decision or tweak their own curriculum. 
Both supporters and critics of Common Core say it is important for parents to take a closer look at the standards themselves. A lot of that information is available online, and Brian, in many cases, uh, in any case, many families who are informed will help moving forward. Well, I'm sure there'll be much more debate on this, and I know you'll cover it. Thanks, Wyatt. Well, hackers have invaded eBay, and now the popular e-commerce site is asking users to change their passwords. The site was hacked sometime between late February and early March. eBay has an active investigation going on right now, but won't comment on the number of accounts affected. We're told that number could be large. The company did say there's no evidence of any unauthorized activity or evidence of stolen financial or credit card information. That's it for tonight. We hope you'll join us tomorrow. Tell your friends we're on five nights a week. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Catch us again on EWTN's YouTube page anytime you'd like. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight. Good night and God bless you.